Hello and, and a good afternoon to all of you. We hope you are in good health and staying safe. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the Data Protection Regulation 2020 for the Dubai International Financial Center, hosted by NextDime. Joining us today, we have with us Krish Bhatt to help us understand, to help the companies in the DIFC decode the law and understand its implications on their business. Krish has over 14 years of extensive experience working with the IT, financial, travel and tourism, logistics, media and entertainment, banking and the poultry industry to name a few. He is a certified information systems auditor and a certified information system security professional. Krish specializes in technology risk consulting, ERP implementations and moderating training related to technology. He has handled several engagements at various international forums and is in the CSSP Speakers Bureau with his clients to help them customize web-based ERP solutions and implement proactive financial ERP and tally ERP9. We welcome you, Krish, to this webinar. Before we begin, please listeners are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please share them in the questions box on the control panel, and we will address your queries towards the end of the webinar. We are happy to host today's webinar for all our listeners. Without any further delay, we shall now start. Over to you, Krish. So, very good afternoon to all of you all. This has been a very interesting year. Uh, you have a pandemic that we are all walking through. Two years back, you had GDPR that got introduced. So it has been extremely interesting times and trying times. In an era where you need information to look for a cure for the pandemic, we are also looking at ways and means to stop people from misusing information. GDPR was the first step in that direction. And now DIFC, with an objective of not to be left behind, has come out with a data protection regulation 2020. It's a step in the right direction. It aligns DIFC's posture as a leader when it comes to international regulations. Today, I'll take you all through some of the areas of the data protection regulation, try to simplify the challenges that a person faces with the expectations of this regulation. And as we traverse through this entire regulation, trying to deconstruct each of the clauses and the requirements and ask, we would also be able to articulate and understand what is it for me to do in this and how do I handle this? As they say, this will also pass and we'll get through this together. So to begin with, this regulation, if one looks at There is quite a lot of things in terms of coverage. So you have grounds of processing, you have high categorized data, you have data controller, data as subject, a few exemptions that have been thrown in. Some other aspects that people need to look at, restrictions on transfer, and some takeaways in terms of do's and don'ts. So the objective of this regulation was, one, to replace the existing data protection law. Second, to align DIFC more closely with GDPR, which enhances the acceptability as DIFC becomes a bigger processing center from an European Union perspective. Export of data or information from DIFC to European states covered under GDPR and vice versa is easier and organizations find it more easy to do business. So with this objective in mind, 
the DIFC regulation 2020 was introduced. Now let us go to grounds of processing information. So what are the similarities of this regulation with GDPR? That is an area which we need to now look at. As I change my slide. Uh, Jugal, can you just help me with the presentation? I believe my internet is having some issues because of which the slide is not updating. I'll that question. Give me just one moment, please. So we could go to the slide on similarities with GDPR. There you go, Krish. So, yes, thank you. So similarities with GDPR, if you look at, there were some core concepts which were required that was not there in the erstwhile data regulation that was there in DIFC. So what has now been introduced? One is data protection principles. So you have data protection principles like fairness, lawful and transparent processing, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, security and accountability. For the first time, concepts like data controller, data processor, data subject, data protection officer, commissioner of information processing have been introduced. Further, special categories that require more care has been defined. Data subjects have been given rights. So they have right of access, example, right of request to deletion, right to object processing, right to restrict processing. Data protection officer. So for entities within DIFC, Processing data that is considered as high risk categorized information. It has become important to have a data protection officer. Alternately, the regulation very clearly expects that a responsible person, if not a data protection officer, needs to be appointed from the organization itself. Also, another mandate which is very clear is that data protection officer has to be a resident of UAE. Jugal, can you move to the next slide? The bill. So let's understand at a very broad level how the bill has been designed. So it starts from general requirements, lawfulness of processing. So four grounds for processing personal data has been introduced. Seven rights have been offered to data subjects, 10 chapters, 65 sec sections, 53 pages, a chapter on exemptions. Four months have been defined as the date to deploy. So the bill comes on 1st July 2020 and all DIFC entities are expected to comply and have processes in place by 1st October 2020. For the first time, measures to ensure transparency and establish accountability has been defined. And six grounds for processing of personal data is something which has been considered. So as we understand this bill in total, in entirety, we realize the objective was one to align with the principles defined by GDPR. The timing was that it's been two years since GDPR as a regulation has now matured and there are a lot of things that has brought clarity. So it was imperative for DIFC to have this bill going and that is the reason for introducing it. There are some overlapping clauses with GDPR, but 
there are some uniqueness which have been maintained by DIFC to ensure ease of doing business. So as we move to the next slide, applicability. So this law applies in the jurisdiction of DIFC, applies to processing of personal data. All entities incorporated in DIFC will now have to comply with this regulation, applies to all entities that process personal data, even if they are outside DIFC, but the data resides within DIFC. So in a way, extraterritorial jurisdiction has been captured and covered in the regulation. So let's move to the next slide. Definition of personal data. So if one tries to understand the definition of personal data as indicated in Schedule 1 of the regulation, it is about a natural person who is directly or indirectly identifiable having regard to any characteristic trait or attribute, any other feature of identity of such natural person, whether online or offline, any combination from which we can infer information. So to give an example, say I am a Harrison Ford critic. I have online blogs regarding him. By reading those blogs, if one can infer this is Krish who has been writing these statements, then the platform which is enabling these blocks will need to ensure my personal data is protected. So inference also is now getting correlated to handling of personal data. The definition has been kept very broad to ensure it encompasses and covers most of the areas that are necessary. Can we move to the next slide? Special categories of personal data. Now this has also been defined. Earlier this was not defined, so it was not so clear. But now this is absolutely clear. So racial or ethnic origin, communal origin, political affiliation, health, life, sex, life, biometric data, genetic data, uniquely identifying a natural person, maybe your trade or union membership, criminal records, philosophical beliefs, religious beliefs, all of this are considered as special categories of personal data and they elicit explicit consent from a data subject, unlike an implied consent which was necessary earlier. So can we go to the next slide? Grounds for processing and controller obligations. So this is something very new. How do I and why do I ask for information from an individual? Why do I consider that information to be personal? And how do I capture it? How do I use it for processing? And what do I do after it is processed? Can I process information every time or do I need to keep asking permissions whenever I need to process? All of these questions have been very clearly aligned in Article 2A of the regulation and it's quite comprehensive. The section speaks about lawfulness of processing and further it goes to explain how do you process sensitive personal data. Primarily, there are two pillars that it talks about. One is legal grounds. So you need to process and the requirement should be for a legitimate business requirement. Second, consent needs to be obtained through lawful means. Third, purpose for which processing is sought for needs to be looked into and very clearly articulated. There are a few exceptions where information can be collected to protect the vital interests of data subject. It could be collected by the government authorities for defense of the country. It could be collected in personal interest, public interest, and it could also be a part of contractual necessity. 
so the way the entire article has been designed step by step the regulation explains very clearly why do i need to collect information how do i process it what are the objects for processing what are the purpose and what are the exceptions similarly article 2b speaks about processing sensitive personal data and again very clearly articulates you need to have a valid reason for processing personal data which is sensitive in nature second you need to obtain explicit consent for it third you need to be aware for how long you need to use that data in certain cases it has gone further to elaborate that processing can be only once and if you need to reprocess you need a reconfirmation so that's quite explicit and clear in the regulation and that is one very beautiful thing of the way this entire difc data protection regulation has been drafted it is quite clear in most of the areas and the expectations are also clearly laid down jubal can we go to the next slide please so what happens when you start processing information it brings you to the next question as a data controller so let me just take a step back here let me first explain to you the characters that are a part of this regulation so you have a data controller he is the person who collects information for processing you have a data subject he is an individual a living person who gives his information for processing you have a data processor who could be a third party other than a data subject or a data controller you also have someone called a data protection officer who is an individual who is responsible from an organization perspective to help address all the requirements of the regulation and ultimately you have commissioner of data protection who is responsible for enforcement of this regulation and if necessary adjudicate breach and other provisions now let's understand each of these roles have some accountability and responsibilities to adhere to so we begin with data controller obligations so very clearly defined data controller can collect information only if it is for a legitimate purpose so purpose limitation has been introduced we cannot just keep collecting information for the sake of it we need to be extremely objective and we also need to realize why we need this information for every ask there needs to be a legitimate backing that supports the need for collecting that information second collection limitation so we cannot now moving forward collect information without informing the data subject about the ways and means of collecting it to illustrate when gdpr got introduced lot of websites which used to have cookies had to introduce cookie management policies a data subject had a right to ask websites to forget them the biggest challenge that came forth was for social media websites like facebook and google also there were other websites which used to collect personal information that had to redesign the manner in which they solicit customer information or an individual's information his preferences and choices so collection limitation is a very important clause and it's something that needs to be looked into accountability so one needs to understand that the information collected one is need to be stored in a very secure manner second it needs to be used only for the purposes for which it has been collected third every 
one who has access in the entire supply chain is obligated to protect so a processor for example if someone collects information from you and then that information is transferred to a third party to process the data controller has an obligation to intimate you about the end use of this information second the third party that is processing the information is also accountable to protect it in the same way as the data controller would have protected there is also storage limitation so i cannot hold on to your information forever i need to have a clear aligned policy and process in place to ensure information is deleted when the purpose is finished if it is collected for legal purposes it needs to be erased when the time limit as per the regulation has been exhausted for any other exception it needs to be clearly informed and intimated to the data subject that this is the information that has been collected and would be remaining forever third accuracy now accuracy is a very important point so this obligation creates a dilemma for the controller even gdpr has not been very clear on this front and so as the difc data protection regulation how do i ensure accuracy of the information collected is up to date forever so there are two types or two things that i need to do one i need to facilitate a provision where data subject or an individual has a method and means to keep his information relevant and up to date second i need to have a process in place to reach out to the data subject at regular intervals say between 12 to 18 months to revalidate the information that i hold about him if i don't have these processes maintaining accuracy of the information itself would become a challenge and the non compliance to this could lead to administrative fines lastly privacy notices so it is very obvious and evident that you need to have a privacy notice on your website or through any other means that you can communicate to the person whose information you are carrying or collecting the notice has to very clearly articulate what is your stand in terms of protecting an individual in this data protection regulation second the notice should also be very clear in intimating and providing an opportunity to the data subject to object to processing of his information or to restrict the controller from processing his information further it also needs to provide him a workflow or access to a methodology whereby the data subject can request for erasure or deletion of the information that the controller holds about him lastly it may also need to define a method or means where the data subject can come back to me to update his information and keep it accurate and up to date too many things yes so although it's a very small regulation 53 pages only and 65 articles each of those clauses and sub clauses as you read through you realize ki the expectation is quite humongous and one needs to be extremely mindful about how he goes about complying with this regulation so jugal can you move to the next slide please high risk categorized data so as i said this is a very new introduction earlier this was not there in the regulation high risk category of data so again a mention of this has been done in the act further definition of what constitutes to be high risk has been defined in the schedule 1 of definitions so high risk processing activity could be adoption of new technologies so they have tried to address the change that comes about because of technology 
profiling technology is something which is moving at a very fast pace analyzing a person's habit online reviewing a person's health information there is technology now where through artificial intelligence a patient's scans can be analyzed using computer algorithms this is really risky but that's the reality of the new world that we are living in and doctors rely on these scans to derive their results and prescribe medications so these technologies which are getting introduced at a faster pace and as we adopt technologies it is becoming more and more difficult for an individual to exercise his rights on the right usage of technology all these activities which done with the help of technology automated calculations and algorithms have now been bucketed under high risk processing activity so in a way the regulation is trying to give back the right to an individual where he does not realize how his information is being used if there is considerable special category of personal data being processed to give an example the social media applications that you use chatting applications that are being used one does not understand that the conversation topic which moves on a twitter or on a whatsapp chat conversation now gets profiled analyzed and based on it insights are being sold to advertisers and marketing agencies to profile and put forth the right kind of product to a customer or to a group of customers now this was something which we were never anticipating earlier but the pace with which technology has evolved this has only become imminent now for these things to happen the regulation tries to control that and by keeping it broad based and mentioning use of technology or technology methods it tries to bring rationality to this madness it tries to put in place a perspective where it becomes easier for an individual consumer to understand what is appropriate for him and what is not extensive evaluation of personal aspects example your behavioral pattern on social media websites your buying and purchasing habits on online e-commerce websites your entertainment choices your restaurant visits your blog posts all of this is consolidated and analyzed to profile you electronically as an individual these things happen without your knowledge further this information is shared across to companies for a value for them to understand and proposition the right kind of product or solution to you so what you actually realize and try to take as an informed decision is nothing but a profiled targeted product which has been put forth to you and a need is created gone are those days when we would make informed choices now you read what you are supposed to be sold you are taken to the decisions that you are supposed to be made for profit of some entity or the other in the online world nothing is free so it has a price and you need to realize that high amount of personal data being processed by a particular platform is also going to be considered as high risk processing activity further the act the regulation has made it mandatory to have a data processing officer for organizations which are involved in high risk processing activity they are also expected to take permission of commissioner in certain cases high risk processing activity if it is outsourced or if it is handled outside the difc 
special permissions are necessary guidelines to that effect still to come but clarity on in the form of faqs as to what is high risk processing activity what is consent what do you mean by data subject rights has been released in the last two days jugal can you move to the next slide please data controller so data controller plays a very important role in the entire regulation you could consider the organization to be a data controller which collects information for various objectives so for its employees the information is collected for employment from its customers the information is collected to profile and provide the right kind of solution from its vendors to ensure that service is up to the mark from its consultants to ensure that they are reachable contactable and information is necessary when required now controller has several obligations one of the primary obligations is he cannot just collect information the way he was collecting earlier so what needs to be done he needs to have a process of taking consent consent from whom from his employees in case he is collecting sensitive personal information of employees from his customers if there are some information that he takes during the course of execution of his deliveries that gives him access to personal information from his vendors if they are involved in processing his customers information or they are facilitating him to manage his technology to give an example maybe i have a third party vendor managing my server he has administrative access to that server and that server has databases of all my customer personal information i am a credit rating agency so as a part of my service delivery i have access to lot of personal financial information credit worthiness of individuals and this is sensitive and i have a server management agency the third party vendor who has access to my server and administrative privileges to manage my database so one of my key obligations would be to further percolate my accountability to my vendors so the entire supply chain becomes accountable third party risk management and fourth party risk management start becoming more and more relevant under this new regulation second aspect of obligation limitations on purpose of processing personal data so gone are those days when i could collect information or i could say that it's okay if some additional information is available it will be good for us for future use from 1st july 2020 you need to realign your process to ensure you collect as much as is necessary and you don't collect something which is not required it has become more relevant and important for us to be mindful about what we are collecting and how much of it is necessary for us third is the collection itself so you need to define your collection points you need to define the attributes that go into your collection points so collection could be for subscription to your website newsletters collection could be in lieu of fulfilling a legal obligation that is aml or maybe some other legal requirement collection could be purely for marketing purposes you need to define your collection points you need to define your data elements you need to define the assets which would act as collection points next slide so further obligations would be period of data retention nature and category of information then source of data collection details of entities with whom personal data would be shared procedures for filing complaint redressal mechanism purpose for collection so a data controller is supposed to handle all of these also as a part of his obligation 
so data control or obligations is a universe on its own and there are a lot of aspects that an organization needs to now be mindful about and take care of can we move to the next slide further after i collect the data the journey is not over there is more that comes in i need to maintain the quality of personal data processed so that is leaning from the data accuracy clause i need to restrict on how long can i hold to the data so data retention clause gets activated i am accountable for the data that i hold so data storage security and protection around the data becomes important and consent is necessary for processing sensitive person data so explicit consent requirement which is primary and which has come out very clearly in article 2b now has to be followed next slide data subject so this is the individual whose information we are trying to protect i would say this introduction of data subject as a concept is like giving back the rights that we had all along missed it helps us make informed decisions now it also helps us ask for things from a data controller and also be aware of what kind of information is getting processed so if you look at the rights you have right to confirm and access you have right to correction and erasure you have right to data portability so now you could collect the information from a particular controller and take it in readable format and transfer it to some other controller so you did not get stuck just because your information is non transferable right to be forgotten so you can request somebody to delete your complete information and he cannot refer to it without taking your explicit consent again right to be informed so any time there is a change in the purpose for which the information collected is being processed you have the right to be informed about the change and lastly you can request for this information and also object to processing of information you can also request to restrict processing of information this is something really wonderful so you can object to processing you can object and restrict from processing this is something which was never there so you can object because you already have a right to know what kind of information is getting processed so it's a corollary or fall through from the right to know rights that have been given to the data subject next clause next slide so your right to access has to be free of charge it can be by email the response or electronically it should be portable and usable format another thing that gets added here which i have read is that you can also raise request to know what information is being collected through a telephone call and if it is sensitive personal information then the data controller needs to follow validation procedures to identify your identity validation before sharing information with you right to delete so you can ask for deletion of personal information there is some covenants that protect a data controller so one of those covenants says that in case too many requests have been raised by a data subject and if the data controller is able to establish that the number of requests is extremely excessive and is unreasonable he can deny providing that information again and again the case ultimately will be adjudicated by the commissioner to determine its merits but there is definitely a counter clause that helps prevent harassment of data controller and his ability to do business as usual next slide some exceptions so complete transaction requested by a customer so if there is a financial transaction because of which information is collected 
then you need to hold on to it for some regulatory compliance or for completion of your annual financial reportings you can hold on to that information even if there has been a request to delete it in case the information has been accessed in lieu of a security incident you can definitely hold on to that information in in case the information was collected as a part of a programming use case and now you need it for debugging to identify and repair errors you can definitely hold on to that information even if there is a right to delete or forgotten compliance to legal obligations so if regulatory obligations expect you to hold data certain information for longer periods of time or if it is for the law of the land then you can hold on to that information even if there is a request from the data subject further to ensure innovation is not stifled research scientific historical and statistical are considered as exceptions for data subject information retention also for internal security purposes defense purposes and other obligations defined in other regulations information can be held back even if there is a right from data subject for deletion yes you guys next slide so some exemptions these are not very detailed we await regulation to come up with more detailed exemptions so right now the exemptions that or exceptions that have been put forward is in case information is collected to protect members from malpractices dishonesty improper conduct or if information is protected or collected in lieu of an investigation or prosecution criminal or unlawful behavior then you can definitely keep it with you without consent the difca board of directors may also come up with further areas which will be giving exemption so right now there is a chapter defined on exemptions but there is no clear list of exemptions that have come forth next slide some other aspects that we need to look into identity validation although it has not been very explicit and clear like california consumer protection act which elicits identity identification as one of the parameters for identifying information that is being shared with the data subject there is a passing reference in difc data protection regulation 2020 that where an individual requests for his information through a telephone identity validation is necessary before sharing information with him this clause is not applicable where the information is sought through a website but data controllers need to be very clear when it comes to sharing of sensitive personal data it's a good practice to have identity validation procedures in place this slides just elucidates that so if you could have an email or a phone verification process or you could have a third party id validation process or you could confirm from a known user some information about him which validates him to be the one who is the owner of that information you could use our existing processes to validate you could have a login process although login is not recommended if you go by the plain reading of the regulation and you could also have a process of collecting the id next slide please certain transparency and accountability measures are required so data protection will have to be by design and by default so it cannot be an afterthought appointment of data protection officer and data protection audits is something that we can look forward to data protection impact assessment is now relevant and is a reality there are maintenance of records that are necessary especially the data risk register processing register and several other that are required the data flow diagram the data flow blueprints 
so on and so forth which needs to be maintained on a regular basis whatever you are collecting the purpose needs to be very explicit and legitimate and the processing has to be fair and transparent so now you cannot have in fact if i read through and i have read through the regulation you realize somewhere along the way they are also having clauses that speak about secondary sources of information collection so say if i have collected information about an individual from a marketing database i need to reach out and inform or intimate that data subject or provide him the relevant information of the source from where i have got this so we need to be very very careful about how we start collecting data and at times you need to inform that information was collected to protect the vital interest of data subject but such an information that you have collected it to protect his vital interest has to be communicated to the data subject so communication enhances and effectively demonstrates your transparency and fairness in the entire activity let's go to the next slide there are definitely some clauses on restriction of transfer or exports of information outside difc in fact this clause existed earlier also in the present form they have tried to retain the same originality but also imbibe the good practices put forth by gdpr so now the regulation very clearly puts out that exports to countries which have similar data protection regulations need not require any formal approval or permissions the list of such countries would be provided in the guidance note or the guidelines issued post this regulation becoming live and for other countries one needs to seek permission from the commissioner and demonstrate that they have adequate mechanisms in place to protect private and personal information further if it's part of a conglomerate binding corporate rules apply and one can seek permission for the group as a whole in fact the regulation is quite flexible when it comes to group level activities so if there is a data protection officer at the group level the same can be extended to the operating entity in difc so that's in brief about export and restrictions of transfer of personal data so let's go to the next slide so jugal can you move to the next slide please absence of adequate level of protection so this is just what i just spoke see it speaks about to which countries you can transfer personal data so if the countries do not have the safeguard and remedies that are required under the regulation or there is no certification mechanism then or the transfer does not discharge functions or there are no pre contractual measures then these are considered as serious defaults under the regulation so one needs to start looking at putting this in place especially remedies for data subject redressal and access to his rights continue to the next slide please so a commissioner for data protection is going to be appointed by the king he needs to have the specified time period not exceeding 5 years and he may be reappointed beyond that period only up to the age of 75 years so the commissioner would be the one who would be responsible for enforcement of this regulation and he needs to ensure for the smooth operation of this regulation 
in a timely manner introduce guidelines and guidance notes to help effectively roll out the regulation next slide penalties something very very interesting and different about penalties in this regulation they have taken a leaf out of difc to have administrative fines which are quite exorbitant in case of data subject rights not being addressed you have administrative fines which can go up to usd 100000 dollars besides that the data subject will have a recourse to go to the court of law and seek additional damages and compensation further the commissioner has a right to adjudicate and decide upon the fines over and above the administrative fines so data subject rights has been given lot of importance penalties have been defined for non compliance to specific articles in the regulation rather than as a percentage as defined in gdpr so it becomes very well defined and specific so one needs to be aware that non compliance would lead to penalties ranging from 10000 us dollars up to 100000 us dollars which is quite heavy the bill also further says in case of serious offenses it would be handed over to the penal code uae penal code where a data controller could also face imprisonment and other kind of liabilities due to non compliance so it becomes a little more stricter and that is why organizations need to take this seriously and have controls in place to handle data subject requests and processing of information so i think that is bringing us to the end uh, jugal can you go to the next slide please so the way forward that we usually recommend to people and in places where these regulations have been introduced globally starting with gdpr then california consumer protection act singapore pdpa or lgbd or thailand data protection act is that one is you invest in the right kind of consultant or right kind of advisor who can help you traverse through this regulation since penalties are very high and there is lot of work to be done in terms of bringing you up to scale it would be better to use an expert rather than experiment on your own you need to maintain your global disk data risk registers so you need a platform or you need a proper documentation to be in order privacy impact assessments would become the need of the r you need to have a proper data breach incident management system in place one needs to start getting ready with data protection audits which could be ordered by the commissioner or in case of organizations which do high risk processing by the data protection officer himself the act or regulation does speak about accreditation and certification but as of now there has been no indication how that would be rolled out as and when they come up probably we would have guidance on the same so with these small thoughts i park myself and i open up the forum for questions there are a few questions that have come up i'll just take a couple of them uh, for you krish give me one moment please all right the first question that we have krish uh, says if there is a breach in any of the company documents then how do we go about tackling that uh so it was more like if there's a non compliance in the way i maintain my processing registers how do i go about tackling that if i understand and capture the question correctly so if you have not been up to the mark in maintaining your registers there is a lawful processing and expectation of what data records you need to keep under the regulation you would be in breach of two articles prescribed in the regulation and that may expose you to fines ranging from 25000 dollars 
to fifty thousand dollars plus some other areas for non-compliance as may be imposed by the commission. So first step, you need to hire a consultant or you need to start looking at how you need to fix it. So maybe a gap or an as-is assessment would be recommended. Based on the inputs or outcomes of that assessment, you could take it to the next step of putting in or filling in the blanks and establishing a baseline. Third, have a process in place to incorporate this as a part of your business process itself. That means every time you sign up a new contract, you need to incorporate that you update it in your processing register. You define the collection points. You also identify the attributes of the data that you are collecting. How is it stored? How is it shared? For how long you need to store it? All of this needs to be captured in your data processing risk register. Yes, Jugal, next question. Yes. Krishna, the question is, can you elaborate a little on the applicability of the bill on Indian or international citizens that are visiting the DIFC? So uh, the bill talks about entities operating in DIFC collecting personal information. So if you are an individual who visits DIFC for business purposes, then it is in lieu of a contractual obligation. So it addresses it to that extent. If you're in DIFC as a part of an employment obligation, then again, it's a contractual obligation. The bill definitely addresses the areas that need to be taken care of in such cases. But if you are a citizen of India and you're only communicating with entities in DIFC, then the obligation is not on the entity, DIFC entity. So this is more for information that is collected from people operating within DIFC entities and it is about individuals, it is not about corporates. So unlike GDPR, where it is talking about residents in European Union, where resident does not necessarily mean citizens, this regulation does not speak much on that lines. It is more emphasizing on entities processing information within DIFC. Thank you, Krish. Krish, we have one more question. I think this is a combination of multiple questions. I allow you to break it the way you feel relevant. The first part is what happens to data entered on government sites? Is the government also liable for this particular law? And how do we communicate this to our clients and to our partners? And the second part of the question is, is there a standard template for consent available from companies in the DIFC for collecting data? Okay. Two parts. One, information collected for lawful processing or lawful reasons. So if there is a legal requirement for you to collect information. So when you say government websites, it's a legal regulatory requirement. Consent is not required in such cases. So there is an exception which has been defined in the regulation itself. So where information is collected for purposes of abiding with a regulation or law of the land, or if information is collected for protecting the vital interests of individual citizens, or information is collected by individuals, they are not covered under this act. So it is exemption. Further, if information is collected for scientific or research purposes, again, consent is not required. So that was first part of the question. Jugal, can you repeat the second part, please? The second part of the question, Krish, is how can we communicate with clients and partners? And is there any, particular, any standard template for Perfect. consent so, from DIFC companies for collecting data? So there is no standard template for obtaining consent, but if one does a fine reading of the regulation, it talks about some areas that the consent form should have. One is purpose. So purpose has to be very clearly articulated. Second, how the processing is going to take place. Third, for how long the processing is going to take place. 
and for how long I need this information. So if you are able to communicate these three things and further give information about who is responsible, how to reach out to the organization in case you want to update or request for information, I think your consent is complete. One needs to communicate that to both customers, vendors and customers and to third party consultants, so on and so forth. But when you communicate, you could communicate through your website. So you could have a privacy policy on your website, which provides clear links to other areas. Thank you, Krish. Krish, I'll take, I'll take up this as the last question, uh, given the time. Uh, the question is, uh, is there any way that we can guide uh, our clients or our partners with data breach notifications? And the second is, if there are any data protection impact assessments that can be done to ensure compliance. Uh, probably, Jugal, you'll have to again break it into two questions. Question one and then pause. And then I'll take up the second question, if you could repeat it. Sure, no problem. The first question is, uh, is there any way that we can guide uh, our friends at the DIFC in addressing data breach notifications? That is the first part of the question. The second part is, are there any assessments that we can potentially provide to ensure smooth impact of these particular assessments? So uh, data breach identification and notification could be an activity where we can advise and definitely support organizations by setting up an incident management process in place, having an appropriate workflow to help organizations identify and once identified, handle the data breach in a manner where they are able to notify in the earliest possible time. So this regulation, unlike GDPR, does not prescribe 72 hours to be the upper limit for reporting. But it does say that data breach notifications have to be intimated to the commissioner. And in case the impact of the breach is severe and the data subject is going to suffer, then we also need to further intimate to the data subject. Having a process, we can advise organizations on how to set up the process, either electronically or manually, depending on their budgetary constraints. That is first part. Second part of the question, data protection impact assessments definitely uh, we have the wherewithal to do that and we have tools that we use to get this done electronically so we have a proper data discovery and other aspects that captures the attributes the assets the location of the assets the entire life cycle of the data that is getting percolated and moved and also the impact in case any of these components in the entire cycle gets breached. So I hope I have addressed both the questions. I hope so too. Thank you very much, Krish. All right, this brings us to the end of today's session. Once again, thank you to all our participants for your time. We hope you've been able to draw a great amount of insights and information from this session. For those who have any specific query, do send it, us, do send it to us at thinknext at nexttime.com and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining in. From all of us, next time, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Krish. Thank you.